good evening, doctors. I am Pradeep Patni. I look after Acumentis. <clears throat> Great pleasure to have you here with us today evening. And I hope you and your family are healthy and safe. Before we start, I thought I'll give you a quick sense about Acumentis. Doctors, Acums is India's largest manufacturing setup and 12% of all the pharmaceutical tabs, caps, injections, etc., which are sold in India come from our stable. Acumentis is the formulation marketing setup under Acums and we currently span the therapeutic areas of gynecology, pediatrics, ortho, dermatology, ENT, and of course, cardiology and diabetology. Quite a few brands of ours, maybe not in this therapeutic area, but in others, were first of their kind, and we take great pride in successfully launching innovative formulations. Going forward, we would want to create initiatives that will make us more relevant and visible in your clinical practice. And we look forward to your advice and suggestions that will help us make our products benefit more and more patients. Thank you so much, doctor. I'm sure it would be a wonderful evening. And over to you, Altaf. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, at the outset, I, Altaf Kazi, take utmost privilege in welcoming all of you to this prestigious and important ESD Connect initiative. I'm proud to say that here that the objective of Acumentis and our division, Novelties, is to promote the notions of continuous learning among diabetes endocrinologists. Uh, I also take utmost pride and privilege to welcome all esteemed faculty and delegates to this important ESD Connect initiative. I'm indeed thankful to Dr. Bipin Sethi, Dr. Prasanna Kumar, Dr. Uday Fertke, and Dr. Sanjay Galra for participating in this initiative. This special wrap-up session is a culmination of those daily updates, and to do so, let me welcome Dr. Prasanna Kumar from Bangalore, who has graciously agreed to be the moderator of this ESD Connect initiative. I will just uh, uh, take... Uh, a minute to share the slide, uh, if I can share the slide quickly for the introduction. Yeah, please go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Dr. Uh, Prasanakumar, welcome once again. Uh, Dr. Kim Prasanakumar has been uh, practicing since 1980 and has vast experience in his field. He is currently attached to the Center of Diabetes for Endocrine Care. He is also CEO of Bangalore Diabetes Hospital in Vasanagar. In addition, Dr. Prasanna Kumar has been teaching undergraduate, postgraduate, and postdoctoral students at MS Ramaya Medical College in Bangalore. He has been president for Endocrine Society of India, he has been president for Research Society for the Study of Diabetes in India, has been vice president for Diabetes India. He has extensive research involved in clinical and academic research in 1992 in the fields of diabetes and ecology. He has more than 100 articles pertaining, pertaining to endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism published in national and international journal. He has immensely contributed to chapters to RSSD textbooks of diabetes, endocrine society of India, manual of endocrinology, etc. So, Doctor, welcome to this important event. Let me also welcome Doctor Uday Fertke, who has been at Sayadi Hospital to Hormones and Diabetes Care from Pune. He is a well-known endocrinologist and diabetes from diabetes from Pune. He has received multiple awards during his academic years. Dr. Fertke has completed MBBS from BJ Medical College, which is known to produce top class medical professionals, has been awarded with Srimati Bhandarkar Memorial Award for Excellence, Academic Excellence in the DM examination, and a special citation by the University of Bombay for securing highest marks amongst all candidates. After passing the DM examination, Dr. Fertke worked as a lecturer in endocrinology at KM Hospital for about six months before he returned to start his own practice. Dr. Fertke also holds an advanced endocrinology preceptorship from the prestigious Johns Hopkins Institute, Baltimore, USA. In 2015, Dr. Fertke was awarded the prestigious fellowship of the American College of Endocrinology. Dr. Fertke has wide experience in treating patients with diabetes and endocrinology disorders. Dr. Fertke, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Kalra has been Vice President of South Asian Federation of Endocrine Society. He has been attached to endocrinologist as an endocrinologist with Bharti Hospital Karnal. Has been a sound scientific foundation. Dr. Karla Kalra has been instrumental in providing editorial skills to several national and international medical journals focused on various variety of subjects like endocrinology, diabetes, geriatric, family practice, medical research, pharmacology, hypertension, and nutrition. He has an executive director of the Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism and editor in chief of the International Journal of Clinical Case Investigation. He enjoys various prominent positions in medical societies, one of them being the rank of the vice president 
of South East Asian Federation of Indian Society, which I just mentioned, since 2013. He is an international lecturer and author of numerous published peer review research papers and active peer reviewer. He has delivered, uh, he has delivered a cornucopia of lectures on various aspects of endocrinology all across Europe, America, Africa, and Asia. With over 200 papers published till date, Dr. Karl Rai is associated with significant contribution in publication. He has a plethora of experience as a clinical research investigator in the areas of diabetes, hypertension, osteoporosis, dyslipidemia, obesity, contraception, and male infertility. His outstanding research background has earned him several national clinical awards, including the Investigator of the Year 2008 from the Indian Society of Clinical Research, the Dawn Award in 2009, and the Professor B. N. Srivastava and late Mrs. Sundar Lari Award 2012 from RSSDI. Welcome, Dr. Sanjay Kalra. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Navid Sattar. Uh, Dr. Navid Sattar is a Professor of Metabolic Medic Medicine, Institute of Cardiovascular and Medicinal Sciences, University of Glasgow, UK. Dr. Sattar is a top healthcare professional specializing in neurology, diabetes, and metabolism and cardiovascular disease. He is renowned for his work in diabetes. According to the University of Glasgow, where he works, he is known for his epilogy work in diabetes, prim working primarily with Scottish, Swedish, English colleagues, but also others around the world. He has been a key participant in relevant emerging risk factor collaborative papers, as well as leading other local papers within his own group. Dr. Sattar is an honorary consultant in metabolic medicine at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. He is currently leading five clinical trials regarding heart failure, insulin, diabetes, and one regarding the coronavirus effect on the heart and lung. At present, Dr. Sattar has co-authored a total of whopping 1,469 publications throughout the span of his career. These publications have been cited 94,300 times. He has led and participated in 36 cl total clinical trials. The top conditions for the trials have been diabetes as well as type 2 diabetes. The top intervention have been candesatin and placebo. So Dr. Navi Sattar, thank you for joining us. Welcome to you. Now, may I request Dr. Prasanna Kumar to take the proceeding forward from here. Thank you, Alta Kwasi, for the nice introduction and generous introduction as well. Welcome to all the delegates for today's highlights of the EAST, or PELS of EAST. As you know, EAST was held from 28th September to 1st October. And in three days, nearly 700 world presentations were done. There were eight halls. And to go through all these halls, whether virtually or physically imposed them, and maybe very impossible also to go through all this. That's why we have guest faculty, Dr. Navi Sattar, who is going to bring us the pearls of the highlights, what he thinks is the best of the articles for clinicians, as well as the academic persons, and his opinion about these articles. What do we gain from that? What is the knowledge that we get? How do you translate that knowledge to our practice? To tell us all about this, we have Dr. Navi Sutta. At the end of his talk, we have got two chairpersons along with me, Dr. Sanjay Kalra and Dr. Vijay Padke. And we will discuss those papers. We'll ask questions to him. I request all the delegates that if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box, put your name and the city from which you are asking this question so that we'll be answering this question with your name. Over to Dr. Navi Sattar for his talk about PELS of highlights of EAST 2021. Thank you. Um, hope you can see. Can you see those slides? I hope you can. <clears throat> yes. I can't. I don't know how to make it full view because of. But anyway, I think you can see it probably pretty well. There you go. Yeah, that's okay. so let's let's start with this first one. I think it's from. Um, Wait a second. The safety, uh, efficacy of safety of dapagliflozin and kidney and cardiovascular outcomes by baseline albuminuria. So this is a secondary analysis from the DAPA CKD trial, which uh, one of my colleagues, John McMurray, was involved in, but led by Hido Hirschbank, who's a brilliant young nephrologist uh, from, from, let me see. So this is a pre-specified, so the pre, you know, secondary analysis. Um, what they looked at was the effects of dapagliflozin versus placebo based on urinary album creatinine ratio at baseline less than 1,000 mg per mg, between 1 to 3,000, 3,500 or greater than 3,000. Excuse me one second. And the primary composite outcomes were um, sustained greater than 50% declining EGFR or end-stage renal disease or death from kidney or cardiovascular disease. Um, and then they also had a number of secondary outcomes. So this is the bot, you know, the top line data. So 
in terms of primary outcome, regardless of whatever the baseline albuminuria was, the relative hazard benefit was exactly the same, almost identical, no interaction whatsoever. But notice those people who had higher albumin creatinine ratios had higher absolute event rates, particularly in the placebo group, you know, 3.7 up to, so almost a tenfold difference in, in event rates based on albuminuria. So that means the absolute risk reduction was greater, you know, even if the relative is the same, the absolute risk reduction was greater in those who had um, higher albuminuria. And that's because a 40% reduction based on a baseline of 31% gives you a 13.8% absolute risk reduction, whereas a, a you know, 44% based on 3.7, you know, it gives you much less absolute benefit. So that's, you know, that's what you basically see. But, but nevertheless, the relative benefit is exactly the same. The, the absolute benefits are dependent on albuminuria. Um, and this is the same looking at the absolute, the, sorry, the relative benefits in people with, it, with diabetes is pretty much the same, no interaction, P093. And again, in people without diabetes, the benefits were broadly similar. I mean, there's some wobbling, but the numbers are small, no interaction. Again, as you get more albuminuria in people without or with diabetes, at the bottom, you see the absolute event rates in the placebo group are the greatest, you know, 28%. And 46%, you know, so um, again, so for the absolute benefits that the numbers needed to treat will be smaller on people with um, more albuminuria. And in terms of EGFR decline, I'm not going to show you the acute slope, but you, you all know this acutely, EGFR declines with, um, um, with dapagliflozin, but then it, then it recovers, you know that it recovers. But what really matters is the chronic slope. So if you start with a low albuminuria, immediate, moderate, or high, you can see that the EGFR decline was greater in the placebo group in each case, but and it was reduced with the, the dapagliflozin in each case by around about between one to two and a half um, units um, in EGFR slope units um, per year. So, um, um, so that's the and that's really the chronic slope, and that's the totality of chronic plus acute. So these drugs benefit people regardless of albuminuria uh, in terms of relative terms is the summary. Let me see, what have they got a summary? Let me just see, actually. Oh, they don't have a summary. Yeah, oh, they do. Dapagliflozin consistently reduces the risk of kidney and cardiovascular outcomes across the subgroup of base and albuminuria. The consistent patients with and without diabetes affects the DAP and EGFR slope are consistent across subgroups defined by urine albumin creatinine ratio. Um, the proportion of adverse events leading to, I didn't mention this, to study drug discontinuation or serious adverse events was similar across urine albumin creatinine subgroups. Taken together, these findings support initiation of DAPA in a broad group of patients with stage two to four CKD, regardless of baseline albuminuria or the presence of type two diabetes. So I'm happy to stop there if you want any questions there specifically. I don't know if there are any, um, or I'm happy to continue. Can we just to carry on or? I yeah, it can complete, uh, Dr. Navi. Then at the end of it, our chat persons as well as the audience. All right, okay. Uh, okay, let me complete. So uh, just tell me when yeah. to stop. There's, there's, there's a lot of material here, but I think the first one was relatively easy and straightforward. Now, this is a, a very simple study. I, it's a sustained 10 as a kind of phase three trial of um, semaglutide and loraglutide. And they basically looked at the efficacy, at least in terms of risk factors, but not in outcomes, on, 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 of a GIA of these two, semaglutide and laraglutide, on the background of baseline SGLT2, and it's a post-talk analysis. And what they found was, as unsurprising to you, semaglutide and laraglutide reduce hemoglobin A1C from baseline regardless of SGLT2 use. So if you look at the semaglutide, I hope you can see my arrow. If you take, if you add semaglutide one milligram on, on, um, um, on without Baseline SGLT2, you get about 1.8% reduction in hemoglobin A1C. It, on the background of people on SGLT2, you get a 1.6% reduction. And, then, and that might be because people who are on baseline SGLT2 have got lower baseline um, hemoglobin A1, because if the hemoglobin A1 is slightly better, you will get less reduction. And you see the same in liraglutide, 1.2 milligrams. Without SGLT2, 1.1% with 0.7. Now, the really interesting thing is how much more semaglutide, you know, semaglutide gives you compared to laraglutide. You get an extra almost 0.7%, um, one to, to what, sorry, yeah, between one to 
0.7 to 1% lower reduction in hemoglobin A1 with semaglutide compared to liraglutide. And that's probably because I think this is probably a better GLP-1, but I think it's also you get much more weight loss and weight loss effectively improves the pathophysiology of diabetes right at the top upstream compared to any other drug um, that you know. In terms of body weight, actually, here you go. Here's the evidence. <laughs> I'm just, I didn't, I forgot that this data were in. You know, if you look at body weight difference, uh, one milligram semaglutide, you're losing about six, you know, five or six kilograms compared to one to two kilograms of liraglutide. And that extra four or five kilograms is giving you reduction in liver fat. I would imagine it's giving you an improvement in, you know, uh, in reduction in insulin sensitivity and therefore more likely to give you a bigger hemoglobin A1C benefit, which is what you see. So what did they conclude? Addition of GLP-1, semaglutide, laragotide, two in SGLT2 was associated with further reductions uh, from baseline in hemoglobin A1C, body weight, and, and systolic blood pressure. I haven't shown you that, but that's true, without additional safety concerns. They're in line with the other studies and analysis investigating the addition of GLP-1, including a post-analysis of Pioneer 4. And these data expand the evidence base of the safety and efficacy of combining GLP-1 and SGLT-2 and are valuable to clinical decision-making. That was their conclusion. Now, of course, the best data in terms of outcomes comes from the Amplitude O trial, which, which I was involved in, which we just published. Um, uh, we published at the ADA a, a, few, a couple of months ago. And then there was around about 15% of people in that trial of f who were on baseline SGLT-2. And the benefits of f on MACE and renal outcomes were broadly similar whether or not the patients were in SGLT2. So not only are the risk factors improved on top of SGLT2, but there is emerging evidence the outcomes are also improved um, when you add a GLP-1 on top on the background of SGLT2. So the next slide, I don't, um, Dominic Pester from Germany, the physical activity guidelines, East, Mies, West. I don't know, this was a symposium, which I obviously, um, you're looking at this, and effectively he says, how does sitting increase cardiovascular risk? So he, he had this review in Nature Reviews, and, I, and I'm not sure I completely can agree with this. I do think sitting increases cardiovascular risk. I think what he probably means is, if you sit more and are less physically active, then yes, you get these things. But I do think this is an effect of sitting per se, because I spend a lot of time sitting, um, and I don't, and my I think my blood pressure is excellent, my cardiovascular risk is good, because I also break up my sitting by being physically active, but you know, I'm walking about 10,000 steps a day. So I, I, I'm not sure sitting per se is bad for you, and, but people who sit more do have higher risk. It's not because of sitting, it's because you're being less physically active throughout the day. And I think that is the absolute key. So I would take debate with this and I've had some debates. Um, he went on to look at... Um, the dose relationship between physical activity and health outcomes. And he based it on studies that came from our group, based both in, um, in women and in men, which we published in these journals. So this is Carlos's paper. And looking at um, metabolic equivalence, but effectively, if you take 150 minutes physical activity per week in, in white, um, when you look at overall cardiometabolic risk factor control, to get to the same level of risk factor control in Asians, you have to have in, in men 266 minutes of activity. And why? And I think it's on the next slide. You know, Asians, um, if you just look at activity alone, um, Asians obviously are more, have got higher metabolic risk for the same weight and therefore probably do need to be more active. It, I wouldn't take this completely a pinch of salt because most Asians don't even reach 150 minutes. So they're never going to reach 266. This is in men and in women, it was 232. Um, but it just see it, it's another way to say that Asians do have to do more to stay fit and active, whether you keep your weight down or whether you become more active. That's my bottom line. So um, the beneficial effects, basically he showed the beneficial effects of physical activity and the detrimental effects of physical inactivity are well established. And that's true. And I think we've underestimated the importance of being physically active. And one of the messages that I think you need to say to your patients is find some form of activity that you need to do in the context of your lifestyle. So whether that's you know, commuting to work or find activities that you enjoy. And as a community, what we need to do in India and Pakistan and other parts is get young people to be 
to enjoy physical activity and become good at some sports that they will carry on lifelong, you know, whether that's soccer or cricket or hockey or running or whatever. I know there are cultural, you know, aspects that, you know, we need to take into consideration, but physical activity is important. And I, the way, only way I keep up my physical activity uh, is I, I, I monitor my steps every day on this thing. And if it's low, so t- at the moment, I've only done 3,000 steps, actually less, just 3,000. So I'm going to go for a, a decent walk after my main meal today of at least half an hour to build up another 3,000 steps because I know I have to because of my family history of diabetes. So those are the things that I would say to you in your clinical practice. Um, this is a very quick study. I'm not even going to talk to it in detail because it, you know, it's more, it's more in, in animal models and I'm not really a big fan of animal models. It's just all it was saying is, is there any evidence of neuroprotective properties of different diabetes drugs? And they looked at the raglatide, empagliflozin, and the metformin. And what they basically showed was that, yes, compared to placebo, there is some evidence that Lyra and Empa, maybe metformin to a lesser extent, do have effects that when you damage you know, stress the brain, you might reduce brain volume damage and you might improve neurological assessment, particularly for relaglutide. And as you all know, there are ongoing trials looking at an SGLP1 receptor agonist, I think it's semaglutide, in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and that's, that's all I would say there. And I think we really need to wait for those trials in humans before um, the, I, I would fully believe whether GLP-1 receptor agonists or any other drugs, you need hard outcome trials where they, they do have benefits on reducing the risk of dementia or cognitive decline. Okay, the next one is a study that came from Dr. Wernicke from, um, from Berlin, as you can see. And they did a randomized trial looking at the effects of a diet high in unsaturated fat and dietary protein. And they looked, their outcome was intrahepatic lipids, i.e. liver fat. And they also looked at this biomarker called FGF21. I'm not really, I'm less interested in that, but this is the trial, big numbers. They took 502 people. They randomized half to an intervention, NutraAct pattern. So quite a lot of fat, but a lot, most of it was monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. Um, same amount of protein as the control arm. Um, um, same amount, you know, maybe more fat. Slight, but And they also had um, quite high fiber intake, 30 grams of fiber. They used uh, rapeseed oil uh, and, and specifically designed new track foods and the usual care versus, you know, the kind of intervention. So more protein, more unsaturated fat and more fiber compared to the usual care of you know, 30% fat, 50, 55% carbohydrates and 15% protein. Um, what did they find? Um, on the biomarker, very little difference in change, but what they did find was a suggestion that in the intervention group that you reduce liver fat levels. Um, and um, you can see in the intervention arm, they had more protein, they had more monounsaturated, more polyunsaturates, and a suggestion that reduced liver fat. What I don't know what the data was, whether the people who got intervention now, they don't have everybody for some reason. I don't know if they, everyone didn't complete, you know, so you've got to look at the data intention to treat. But what they also showed was people who were adherent to the intervention arm. Now, this is post hoc. It's not really, um, you know, it's not an intention to treat. But nevertheless, people who were adherent had a big reduction in, in intrahepatic fat, liver fat levels, you know, um, of the order of 40% reduction in liver fat who were adherent compared to very little, you know, maybe a 15% change in the control arm. Um, and then they looked at the biomarker. There's some correlation with the biomarker. But the bottom line I, I would say to you is that they're eating a better quality diet. I think I think the evidence on on um, metabolic changes, you know, is the, bo- the dominant effect of any diet is actually through weight change. However you lose weight, you know, you will lose liver fat. In fact, I had a patient in my clinic this morning um, who was a colleague of mine. He was in, you know, um, who had diabetes two years ago, had now got diabetes remission, and he undertook a low carb, um, a, a low carb diet. He managed to lose weight that way, and his liver fat reduced substantially, and he, his diabetes went under remission. Now he's still struggling to keep on su- sustaining that, but you know, the, the dominant effect is weight loss. So if you cut calories, you will lose liver fat, and you will improve your diabetes. Um, in terms of compositionally, 
that I think one of the best ways and the evidence is increasingly telling us that is if you eat more fiber, that will certainly help. Um, yes, there's a link between protein and satiety that will help, but whether you can sustain that, and I'd, clearly that's an issue in poorer parts of uh, Asia, whether they can have a high protein intake, um, you know, because of the cost of meat and also the climate aspects. But but for me, carbohydrate, um, I'm not sure about the carbohydrate, you know, but I am convinced that higher fiber and better quality of fat so that um, in the same way in the trial, they tried fats that were long chain. My, my colleague who was in the clinic, he used to be eating a lot of uh, saturated fat, but he's now converted to eating um, olive, lots of olive oil plus nuts as his main sources of fat. And I think that is better if people are going to want to follow a low carb diet is to have unsaturated sources of fat and try and eat more fiber rich um, foods as well. And you get your fiber through your nuts and various other things as well. So that would be my thoughts on that. Um, how, what we're doing uh, for time. We're, oh, we're doing okay, half an hour. Um, so these are people I know from various uh, colleagues in the past. Uh, Max was uh, fun. Eat. I think Max we used to work for Boringer uh, or Derek. Um, I think maybe this is a boring solution. And Ian Neeland is, is a colleague from, from the US um, who's done um, nutritional studies. So basically, this is, um, they've got a whey, uh, whey protein microgel. So they've now made a kind of a nutritional substance in a microgel. And they gave it in a randomized trial in people with diabetes to see does it improve postprandial glucose. And I'm not going to go through what the formulation, this is what they found was. So, um, can whey protein formulation um, that do not contribute significantly to daily caloric intake maintain efficacy? Can, can it, you know, if you take this whey protein closer to a meal, can it reduce postprandial glucose? So this is what they did. I, I actually don't quite know the detail. Hey, Eagle, minus 30, minus 15. Um, yeah, they probably, you know, they gave you this intervention and then they, they, then they had the, oh, sorry, they, they gave you the whey proteins, I think, and then they had meal and then they looked at, changes now this is with this is without the whey protein here's the glucose goes up and it comes down and look at the glp1 goes up because you have a meal effect on incretin but then when they when they added the whey protein what's really interesting that you know the, the minus 30 i think the shot means the whey the whey protein look the glp1 went up even more substantially more by 66 percent. so it's almost like the the whey protein microgel is is like a a natural way to give you a GRP1 boost. And as a result, look, the fasting glucose or the, the postprandial glucose didn't go up as high. Um, shortly, it did, you know, so that they had a 22% reduction in area or 18 to 22% reduction in area under the curve for hypoglycemia. And it's probably a GRP1 effect of the whey protein. And that kind of makes sense because protein can suppress satiety. So it fits with the previous talk. Um, and they also found that Interestingly, having the whey protein gel before your meal, you also increase your phosphate insulin. So again, I think that's probably a GLP-1 incretin effect um, compared to the to sort of the placebo group, as it were. So compared to placebo, this 125 mils, um, so 125 mils, well, it's like a small drink of 10 grams of whey protein taken 15 minutes ahead of a meal significantly increased early insulin secretion uh, by 61%. Uh, at one hour and in 30% at three hours and uh, well altered, you know, and you can see all, you, I've shown you the benefits. The reduction observed in early glycemic burden and augmented insulin and sustained GLP-1 supports this convenient pre-meal shot to improve postprandial metabolic glucose. And, but, you know, it's an, it's an early trial. They need longer term studies to see the full translational metabolic impact. And to me, the real metabolic impact um, would be, you know, how well does it compare to a, uh, on, on long-term glycemic control on hemoglobin A1C is the key. And also does it have a benefits on weight and does it have benefits on, on, on blood glucose and how close does it get to the effect of a drug would be my view, you know, of a GLP-1 receptor agonist, but it's kind of exciting. Um, I think I'm only going to present two more studies because I want to, you know, I think plenty of time for questions. Um, of course, lots of new drugs, lots of new ways to increase uh, GLP-1. This is a paper that came out of my colleagues in Dundee. Ewan Pearson is a, he's a, he's a very good colleague in Dundee. Now, Ruth, one of his fellows, 
she did a study where she looked at low dose sulfonuria and combined it to DPP-4 inhibitor. And they wanted to see, does the combination of these two things at low dose, can you get good glucose control um, as much as a normal dose sulfonuria? And what happens to insulin sensitivity and hypoglycemic effects? So hypothesis at low dose sulfonuria acts synergistically with endogenous incretin to augment insulin secretion in a glucose dependent manner. The effect would be further augmented in the presence of a DPP-4 inhibitor is what the question was. So they did this, I'm not going to go through the design, but effectively um, no treatment for the same patients, uh, randomized crossover, you know, 20 milligrams of glycoside or citagliptin normal dose or the low dose SU. I don't know what the dose was that they used, but it would have been a much lower dose plus a DPP-4. Actually, no, it was 20 milligrams of glycoside, sorry, 20 milligrams. So that is a low dose and DPP-4 and the combination of the two. And they did a mixed meal tolerance test to look at glycemia. What did they find? Oh, it's quite obvious. So this is the control arm. Uh, glucose goes up to about 13 and comes down. With SU, look, you get you know, a big, you know, a decent effect, which is better than the DP54. But the combination of the low dose SU gives you a very good benefit so that the glucose postprandial goes up only to 10 instead of about you know, 13. And here you can see the area under the curve. Um, SU alone at low dose, DPP-4, and the combination of SU plus DPP-4. Um, so you do you are getting a thing. Again, the key metric, and then they also looked at insulin sensitivity and you know, glucose sensitivity. If you believe these things, I'm not fully convinced. I do, but you know, you know, basically you're making more insulin, um, you know, with a combination of SU and DPP-4 as you'd expect, both an incretin and a direct, you know, a secretory grog effect of the, of the, of the issue. Um, so low dose glycoside lowers blood glucose as more importantly than cytokine glycoside with an added effect in combination with, with the two glycoside sitter. Um, no increase in the rates of hypoglycemia. That's a really attractive feature, but it's a relatively small study. You know, they only looked at it for a few weeks. Um, glucose reduction achieved with glycoside concentration far below those achieved with standard therapeutic doses and lower dose and lower and lower than of, of glucoside MR. Uh, may avoid the negative aspects of SU of high dose uh, and the pharmacoeconomic benefit. So imagine again in South Asia, can you give people lower doses of SU in combination with DPP-4 to get a good glycemic benefit without causing hypo? Again, what you need to do is extend this concept to looking at um, changes in hemoglobin 1 over time. Um, you know, is, it, is it meaningful changes? And what about what happens to weight and what happens to hypoglycemia? And you would need to do a trial compared to conventional SU, um, conventional DP4, and a longer term study. But I suspect that's where they're going. I'm not going to do this. I don't think that's that interesting or that. And my final study I wanted to talk about was um, back to the newer drugs, if I may. Um, so there was a debate with Silvio Inzucci, who's a brilliant diabetologist um, in, uh, in in New York, in, in Yale, I think that's New York. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Franz, Francesco Giorgioni. And they both made, you know, so Sylvia said, you know, after um, the, the preferred second line therapy with, with type 2 is an SGLT2. So Francesco said it's GLP1. Sylvia's case was, well, look, look at all the brilliant evidence from all the trials in terms of not just MACE, but also CVD death heart failure and CKD progression. He also said, look, if you look at the best drugs that have benefit across hard kidney outcomes in albuminuria, it's the SGLT2s, not the GLP1s. And then he also said, look, they also have benefits on hemo you know, blood pressure, weight, low hypoglycemia and cardiorenal, and that this oral administration, they're more cost effective, no GI side effects, and usually no dose titration. Um, therefore, they should be preferred second line. Um, our colleague from uh, Italy, uh, I think it's, it's Italy, yeah, from Bari, Italy, Professor Giorgini. Well, he said, look at the GLP-1. Now, he showed some real-world evidence, which I think is a bit dodgy, but never in the mind, showing that the benefits of SGLT2 and GLP-1, you can't really call them benefits in real-world data, um, but they were broadly similar. And that also uh, with GLP-1, you got also benefits on MI, MACE, and heart failure and hospitalization for CVD. Um, but of course, this is not trial data, so this is a bit dodgy. Having said that, the best tr trial evidence of GLP-1 was published by uh, um, 
from my group. We just published it in Lancet Diabetes, looking at the randomized trials. And GLP-1s do lower um, heart failure and kidney disease, but by much more modest, modest extent, somewhere between 12 to 20%, instead of with SGL2, the lower um, cardio, you know, heart failure by about 30 to 40%. The one benefit of GLP-1 over, over SGL2 is benefits in terms of may, uh, stroke. GLP-1 reduced stroke by about 19 to 20%, um, whereas SGL2 do not have benefit on stroke. And they may also have, GLP-1 may also have better benefits than PAD. So that would be my, my thoughts. Um, anyway, Professor Giorgini said, large reductions in hemoglobin A1 in addition to body weight. So yeah, they certainly do have better body weight benefits than, than SGLT2. Uh, Anterathroscotic benefits, particularly stroke, I think is better with the GLP-1. Forget real world evidence. I, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. Look at the trial evidence. Um, most common side effects are GI, but they can be, you know, can be improved with slow dosing and going slow. Um, and, and he's also said treatment could be continued with suspected or confirmed COVID infection, um, uh, which is true. And uh, but we're looking at trial evidence for GL for SGLT2 as well. So uh, we can have that debate here. And I'm I'm going to leave that. I think that's all I wanted to say. I think if 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 I can stop sharing, um, or we can keep on the trials if you want me to. I think that's forty minutes up. Thank you, Dr. Navi Sattar. You have reviewed eight papers. And for your information, CBO Izuki was with us. Izuki was with us a few days back, reviewing his own 78 uh, papers, what he thought best of PAST. So we had an interaction. Oh, now you had Sylvia, so did you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, we had it. And he brilliant. spoke very well, chose yeah, very good fantastic. articles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we really Now it will be unfair if I don't answer the questions. So I'll post three questions which are there from the audience. Then I'll give it to my co-chair person, Dr. Sanjay Kalra, as well as Dr. Uday Padke, their opinion and their questions, their reviews and clinical translation to that. First question is from Dr. Santosh Kumar Patna. Your comment on the difference in A1C with concomitant and sequential GLP-1 receptor unlock and SGLT2 versus duration, eight, hour 10 and uh, Goncalves data. So, what is your comment on this difference in HbA1c when you use concomitantly sequential so GLP-1 I'd, and HC? Well, I'd, I'd be interested to know what, 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 I don't quite know what the question is. Um, um, I mean, I, I, you know, we, we presented the, the data I presented was sustain 10, wasn't it? Um, yeah. So um, I'd, I'd be interested to know what, what the difference is. I mean, the data that I showed or that have been presented the ESD, I think a pretty clear cut. And I mean, you know, I wouldn't complicate it beyond this. You, we all, all of us know that that you get um, you get weight loss with both drugs, but the mechanisms of action are different. You know, one is an incretin effect, cutting caloric intake. Another, the other is getting rid of sugar in your urine because of hypoglycemia. So clearly. If you add a GLP-1 on top of an SGLT-2, you are going to get weight benefit. You are also going to get glycemic benefit and you will get blood pressure benefit because the mechanisms of action of these two drugs, class of drugs, are completely different. So it makes complete sense. Um, the other thing I would say is that the reason I think SGLT-2 have cardiorenal benefits is that they're doing something hemodynamically by changing fluid in the interstitial volume or by reducing nephron stress or stress at the heart, um, which is not what GLP-1. I think the way GLP-1 is working predominantly is anti-atherosclerotic, um, you know, with the GLP-1 effect in vasculature. But they, but because they lose a bit of weight and they reduce blood pressure, they are also having ancillary benefits and heart failure risk as well as the anti-atherosclerosis. And if if you look at our meta-analysis that we published in Lancet Diabetes, the two studies in which had the greatest heart failure benefit with GLP-1 were Amplitude O, and I think the other study was with albuglutide harmony. And those are the two studies where they had the best benefits on MI as well. So GLP-1 is reducing heart failure, varying, reducing atherosclerosis and HEF-REF. And I think, it's, I think it's atherosclerotic predominantly with maybe a bit benefit of weight. SGLT-2 is reducing heart failure and kidney through hemodynamic. And maybe other effects that Milton Packer tells you, you know, cellular benefits in terms of starvation. I don't know, you know. So they're 
And I think they're complementary. And, and, and I think all the evidence from trials that you see on risk factors, amplitude tool on outcomes, and also real world data suggests that these two drugs will have additive benefits on top of each other. That's, that's what I would say, that would be my summary. Yeah, but he has also asked about duration, eight trail and hour 10. How does it compare? Are we aware of it? I, do, I don't know those data. I, I would be interested, you, what, has those, what do those data show? I guess they're just showing risk factors and I bet you they're showing the same thing, broadly speaking. Yeah, I am also not, unless my colleague, Dr. Sanjay Kalra and Dr. Uday, do you have any idea? I have no idea about no. it, that's why. Right. But sir, I think what Dr. Santoshi is asking is, in mm -hmm. Dr. Naveed's OPD, when you mm -hmm. when you initiate a GLP-1 RA in a GLP-1 RA naive patient, ah, and, right, okay. and when you initiate SGLT2 inhibitor in an SGLT2 naive patient, there will be some amount of side effects. You have to do a little bit of counseling. Is it worth the risk? You know, oh, a patient to comes to you for the first time yeah, today, yeah, yeah, and yeah, now yeah, yeah. how long will it take you to explain to the patient the patient has to handle diuresis as well as nausea vomiting. Is it worth it, or would it be fine just waiting for a few days to start? Uh, yeah, no, I, the next I think I think I think that's a very good point. I haven't one. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. I hadn't considered very often. I mean, we generally I have not ever started them both at the same time. I've usually started them sequentially for the exact same reasons you said. And I uh, and I, you know, um, I'm sure there are colleagues who've started them. Probably, but you're right. They probably started them within a few days or you know a couple of weeks after each other. Start the SGLT2 in bed and then start the GLP1. Start low and go slow and you know go up and various things. I think I, I, I'd be interested in your experience as well. No, the question again is I will never start SGLT2 inhibitors if the blood sugar is 250 and above. Okay, I wait till the blood sugar comes below 200 because symptoms may worsen also. So that's why when the HbA1c 9, 10, 11. The best thing is to still start metformin liptins. My third choice will be SGLT2 when the A1C comes down or this uh, hyperglycemia comes down because obviously one. Well, a GLP-1 unlike you can start even ahead of it. Yeah, 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 yeah no, that's the point as well. Yeah, no, that's I, how I, I see. And of course, both of them are useful in obese patients. So my yeah. choice is not SGLT2 first. But it is always metformin first drug, then go to the gliptin, then third choice is SGLT2. And of course, cost of it is very high in India. Less than 0.1% of diabetics in and afford because 85% have to pay from their pocket. There's one more question all three of you can answer. Dr. Santosh Kumar partner has asked, contribution of sarcopenia in the difference among Asians and West. Do you want me to start or do you, I mean, I, mean, I, I can tell you what our data is. You can show. tell your opinion, then I'll ask Sanjay and Uday put it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, I wouldn't call it sarcopenia. I mean, we are made as we are. I think what the evidence shows in the you know, data that we've published, and I, we did a review of, the, of this, South Asians um, in, the, in the UK, you know, certainly, you know, first generation, they have about 10% less muscle mass and about 10% more fat mass. So we do have smaller engines and we carry more fuel is the way I think about it, you know. Um, and that also explains that we, for a given, you know, we have a lower cardiospiratory fitness because we have less muscle mass, we have smaller engines. I think one of the, uh, you know, uh, and the way to compensate for that would be that South Asians do need to stay leaner if we can, but we also, if we can, you know, need to keep up our activity to maintain our muscle mass. Because if we start with less muscle and we have become more active, we're going to lose. We were already starting with less muscle. We're going to lose it quickly and become sarcopenic quicker. Um, so absolutely, I think, you know, the good news, though, is that we've got paper coming out in diabetologia. Second and third generation South Asians in the UK using UK Biobank look a bit taller. They have a smaller waist hip ratio and they have a lower risk of diabetes by about 20 percent than the first generation. So things are changing. Dr. Uday, what's your take on this contribution of sarcopenia among Asians as well as West? I, I completely, oh yes, I completely agree with what Dr. Navid said. And somehow Indians, I mean, for the muscle building to occur also, two things probably might be required. One, of course, is protein intake, which is not so good in Indians. And second is the propensity to do some resistance training or strength training, which most people do not have access to in India. So they may walk or they may 
do a fair bit of aerobic activity for those who exercise, but resistance training is lacking. So yes, as compared to our uh, counterparts in the UK or US, certainly I think we have a lesser muscle mass with more body fat. And that's also from so many other evidences like Yasnik's uh, study and Yudkin's uh, contribution about the thin fat Indians right from birth. So I think, yes, to that extent, we are sarcopenic right from birth. Yeah, another thing is the Yagnik, the, the so-called thin fat Indian is not an entity. It is compared to the Westerners. It is not that you have an entity that all thin Indians have more fat. Actually, it's... it is only one case where it is company fat. It, we should not mistake our all Indians are thin. All Indians have fat is also not right. Because Yagnik was very clear when we had a meeting last day, people always quote my one case as something like a phenotype and all. No, it is not true. When I'm compared to another European, this is what one case that is true. Yeah, it is not that all Indians. Other thing is, Dr. Sanjay, this frailty, what we are talking, the sarcopenia. As Indian becomes older, let us take for SCLT2. Now the classification is mild, moderate, and severe sarcopenia. How SCLT2 should not be used in moderate and mild. Whereas the mild one can be used. So what do you see use of this SLT2 inhibitors in a patient with sarcopenia, elderly patient, compared to normal? This Frail. is a very important topic, sir. And for everybody who is listening, let us just revise the definition of sarcopenia. The classic definition of sarcopenia is you suspect it if there is reduced muscle mass, uh, if there is reduced muscle strength or reduced muscle function. You confirm it if there is reduced muscle mass. This is classic. This comes from the West and it also comes from Eastern Asia. But uh, now a South Asian consensus has been developed, which is uh, a 12 country consensus uh, under publication, where we say uh, you, you define sarcopenia the same way you define metabolic syndrome or the way you define uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. We take two out of three. These two out of three will be any two out of reduced muscle mass, muscle strength or muscle function. So we should be aware of the definition. Secondly, we should be aware that sarcopenia can be primary and secondary. Primary means with aging, everybody will become relatively sarcopenic. Secondary means in a person with obesity or with uncontrolled diabetes, there can be sarcopenia. With this background, when we talk of using SGL2 inhibitors or even GLP-1RA in uh, elderly persons, we should not define elderly just by the calendar or chronological age. We should go according to a frail index or a frailty index. And here, if you have somebody who is always already debilitated, somebody who has poor muscle strength, muscle mass, and is not uh, the best candidate, you know that you know he or she has never done resistance exercises in the past 70 years and is not going to begin now, uh, then maybe SGL2 inhibitors, inhibitors would not be a good drug of choice. We would want to give more of anabolic drugs. Both GLP-1RA and SGL2 inhibitors are not anabolic. It is insulin, which is an anabolic drug. And if you want a substitute, an oral one, you might as well choose a sulfonylurea. And Dr. Naveed has spoken about even glycoside 20 milligram being able to help cetagliptin. So just look at the frailty of your patient. Uh, what the model that we use here, Dr. Naveed, is something called a metabolic triage. You divide all patients into three, maladaptive anabolic, eubolic, and catabolic. Now, when we read the guidelines from US, they just keep on harping about weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. When ACE talks about, uh, talks about its philosophy, uh, out of 14 points, eight are related to weight loss. Okay. Uh, in India, that's not correct. It should be more of weight optimization. One third of my patients are malnourished also. They may not be malnourished in the bigger cities, but if you go to the smaller towns and districts, you will have lean malnourished patients. All of them will not be LADA or pancreatic diabetes. Most of them will actually be very poorly controlled type 2 diabetes. Here we need to increase the weight. And again, GLP-1RA and SGL2 inhibitors will not be good drugs. GLP-1RA is a calorie restrictor and a calorie restriction mimetic. SGL2 inhibitor is a calorie restriction mimetic. If your person is already calorie restricted, either the intake is too little, patient is on a keto diet, or the absorption is limited for whatever reason, then it would be a punishment giving SGL2 inhibitor to such a patient. And that is when all these uh, therapeutic mishaps and misadventures come into, the, uh, into play because we are choosing the wrong patient. So as an Indian physician, just see if your patient is eubolic 
or maladaptively anabolic, then these are the drugs of choice. If not, then there are other drugs to choose from. Yeah, Dr. Sanjay, you told the definition, clinical importance, everything. Now they will ask, how do you measure sarcopenia or frailty? So he is a clinician at bedside. He does not have all that. How do you say this patient has sarcopenia frailty? On what basis you are going to quantitatively measure? And if you are going to follow up these patients with drugs which are anabolic, not catabolic, how do you say my patient is? Simple ways of doing that. The <laughs> simplest way to check muscle strength would be using a hand dynamometer. Even if you don't have a hand dynamometer, you just shake hands with your patient. If your patient is able to shake hands with you properly, uh, based upon age and gender, then your patient is fine, good to go. If your patient can get up from a chair and walk, and these are all uh, objective validated tests, but if your patient can get up without support from a chair and she can walk a distance of maybe six meters, uh, six feet, that's fine. If you want to check muscle mass, do a mid-arm circumference and a mid-calf circumference. The mid-calf circumference should be more than 33 centimeters in an Indian. And that should suffice. Good. These are all simple clinical measurements to say whether you have sarcopenia or not. You have defined it. Also say how to measure. Even bedside, you don't need an extraordinary equipment. Thank you very much. There's a question here. On the heels of ESE, that is European Society of Cardiology, I think, any suggestion of using GLP-1 on top of HCL-2 in obese patients with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Any thoughts, diabetic, non-diabetic, because HFPEF, that is uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is increasing. To Dr. Navid Sattar. Well, I mean, we don't really have any trials in that space. So um, it, it's a good question. And actually, it's a question that needs a trial. And um, I'll be honest, we have designed a trial just to answer that specific question, not just even HEF-PEF, but even also in HEF-REF. Um, there are two small scale studies of GLP-1 in heart failure, which, you know, didn't show any benefit or necessarily, you know, that, you know, but, you know, some people were concerned about one of them, but they're too small. We need an outcome trial. Um, and what people have been more encouraged about is the more recent GLP-1 data, like, like Amplitudo. And based on those results, I, I can tell you some heart failure specialists have come to me and said, could we do a GLP-1 epiglenotide trial in, patient, in our patients with HEF-REF or PEF who are already on an SGLT2 and would there be any benefit of adding a GLP-1? And the only way you're going to know that is by doing a proper outcome trial. We don't have them yet. So, um, so my answer would be, I don't know, but we need to trial that particular question. Dr. Would you have any experience on using the patients with no, both I SGLT2? Yeah. I confess I cannot say in an anecdotal manner what I think. So the whole concept of this HEF preserved ejection fraction has come up new. And we have started to just look at these echoes of late and trying to figure out from our cardiologist friends, what exactly is meant by all that? Because even in the category of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, you know, the echocardiology reports that we get keep on saying there is some diastolic dysfunction. If you send the report to a cardiologist friend, he says, no, I think it's normal. Everyone keeps writing type 1 or grade 1 diastolic dysfunction. So I'm not sure still how exactly as endocrinologists, we are supposed to diagnose diastolic dysfunction unless we earn some mastery in reading echo reports, which I confess I do not have right now. So there are so many factors to look at, and I, I am not sure I'm competent enough right now to diagnose HEFPEF very accurately. Now, the question is today, I had a patient. He's my relative, I mean, a friend's relative, he's 51 year old, diabetic 24 years, and hypertensive 24 years. I had seen him at the age of 80. Now, last week, he developed heart failure, typical left ventricular failure, and he has got nocturnal parasitic dyspnea. Now, he weighs 90 kg, 10 kg is more, he's 182. Ejection fraction done three times in one week, 33%, 30%. Today, he got MRI, which shows 29. 
So this is a definite reduced ejection fraction. When patients have ejection fraction yes. 40 to 60, okay, that is probably preserved. Less than 40 is low and more than 60 is normal ejection fraction. That is preserved ejection fraction. So patients can have heart failure with normal, low or very low this one. This is how the cardiologists, we are not cardiologists, but when you ask for an echo, forget about diastolic dysfunction. I know it is more of the probably the technician who is doing it. Some are echo technician, maybe cardio. But these are the ones when you get an ejection fraction, 30, 40, and above 60, you know it is well preserved or low or very low like that, reduce ejection fraction and all that. So in those patients, initially, most of them are on diuretics. Now the question is, next choice is definitely a CLT2 inhibitor. And you don't prefer, even in a preserved one, you don't prefer, though the cardiovascular benefit, as Dr. Navi said, my choice is always a CLT2 inhibitor. Yes, I now, agree. Even non-diabetics don't come to you and me, they go to cardiologists. Cardiologists use it. And as the data has shown, whether diabetic, non-diabetic, the benefit is there. Apart from this, Dr. Sanjay, what is your experience of using SGLT2 inhibitors as well as the GLP-1 and log in type 2 diabetics, where all of them obese, whether PCOD or non-PCOD? Uh, I, I have used these drugs together in a few patients, but the driving factor has not been uh, heart failure or heart health. It has That's been more of uh, obesity or weight loss. Yes. Let us understand, like Dr. Uday Fadke sir said, that uh, heart failure is evolving very rapidly. And when you look at the current staging, any patient who enters a metabolic clinic or an endocrine clinic, by default, already has stage A heart failure. Whether the patient is hyperpituitary or hypopituitary, hyperthyroid, hypothyroid, hypergonad, hypogonad, Addison's disease, Cushing's, either way, that uh, risk factor is always there. So we have to be careful. We have to be watchful. We have to be vigilant. Uh, I do use, like I said, in a few patients, GLP-1R and SGLT2 inhibitor together. But uh, the main aim there is the weight loss. Uh, I do not think so much about the heart as a, as a primary target. If I'm thinking about the heart as a primary target, I would always want to take the help of my cardiology colleague. And, and... That is true. We cannot treat heart failure. Yeah. But the best result I see in PCOD. PCOD for diabetic obese, I have seen 18 to 20 kg weight loss. You withdraw GLP-1, 10 kg comes back. We try SGT2, 20 kg comes. Of all the diabetics, PCODs are the one which respond beautifully. And I have a lot of patients with this combination. Unfortunately, they cannot afford this. That is the cost. If the cost is not a factor, side effect is not a factor. Lot of our 65% of our patients are obese. Here's a question to both of you. Uh, one of the not... indications of uh, liraglutide is actually an upcoming marriage. So, <laughs> exactly. In fact, this is exactly what I said for you. Short term, back. short term indication. Yes. It works My very well. Right? 103 <laughs> kg. See that she loses 20 kg, and after six months, I will finish her marriage. After that, I am not bothered what happens. Yeah. This is typical Indian mentality, as yes. you said. I think North or East, South or West, this is what Same. we see. Here's a question to both of you who are not cardiologists. Presume you commonly measure NT pro BNP in suspected heart failure in your practice. Well, I, I put that question up because, um, I mean, I, I don't know. It depends if you've got the ASI available. Um, certainly, we've been asked that question. Who, in which of our diabetes patients should we suspect heart failure or should we actually more commonly measure nt pro -BMP to look for heart failure? And that's the big question now. We can't measure it in everybody because it's too expensive. Um, um, certainly, those people who have symptoms, you know, orthopnea, um, and or maybe those people on loop diuretics, um, and then those who have you know lots of risk factors is probably the people we would measure it on. But we can't. What we need is guidance in whom we measure it. But I don't. I was I was asking whether it's measured commonly in India. It is not because I'm sure with they as well as Sanjay myself I have a lab with us wherever we do all the tests. At least I don't have that anti pro BNP because it's nowadays I can get a point of care. I'm trying to get it. As you said, if I can see every diabetic, okay, ECG we have, we don't do echo and all. If we can do the patient today, I saw one week back, he got breathlessness. Next day, his pro in BT was 1,526. The normal yeah. in that. I mean, this is a frank case where you don't need it at all. It's only a quantification, how it has improved. But Dr. Uday, do you use it regularly in your clinic no. in the lab? No. Dr. Sanjay? No. 
it is it is a symptom driven actually exactly and something that i use and i would encourage all the listeners to follow is something called the breast questionnaire b r e s t it comes from france a validated mm-hmm. questionnaire where all you have to do is take a history do a simple examination and look at the ecg and with that there is a 97% chance that you will be able to diagnose heart failure correctly and uh, just a single uh, clinical pearl for everybody which i'm sure all the physicians know if you have a patient who is coming in at 60 65 70 years with breathlessness chances are minimal that it will be a pulmonary cause it is not going to be tuberculosis it is not going to be asthma or copd if it is a recent onset breathlessness at age 60 plus it is most probably going to be cardiac or maybe covid last year hmm. other thing is weakness many times we say weakness as you said 60 65 he is perfectly alert weakness is first i would like to rule out cardiac he will not be able to say breathlessness weakness i was walking 5 km 3 km 2 km this is what it is i think we have already exceeded our time so it's already 10:05 i thank dr navi sir for excellent eight presentation i wish we had one more hour i am sure both my co-chair persons agree with me would have gone probably third bear into each article especially the one you said were sitting for long in um, uh, say in osteoporosis they say if we can sit don't lie down if we can stand don't sit if we can walk please stand don't stand if we can run don't even walk also same thing holds good for cardiology nowadays i see physicians six feet difference you start your clinic 9 o'clock at in, in india till 3 o'clock they don't even get up because i don't want to examine my patient and there are people who work morning 9 o'clock to 11:30 in the night and of course 40 patients in these groups so a lot of doctors have said okay let me have my laptop here i will stand i will not sit two hours patient can sit i can stand and do it this is what software engineers are already doing next phase is will have probably a slow moving uh, what you call um, walker yes, yes. and you are yes. standing on that and you are seeing the patient listening to the entering our water prescription that's all all of us because a lot of them don't have 10000 uh, the steps that will take maybe 2 hours how many of us have 2 hours morning 6 to 10 to take 10000 steps do i go to gym in the morning walking in the evening provided there are no patients sir i do my opd standing sir good that i don't sit at all i don't have, have a chair a, anymore yeah you please have a treadmill also slowly it will go at one maybe 1 km per hour so that in 2 hours you would have walked 2 km patient will not realize dr sanjay is not standing is walking on the treadmill also that is next phase i also do that because otherwise 4 hours you are sitting rather than and maybe what the ad and other fix 150 minutes per week is not sufficient if you want cardiovascular maybe 5 hours there are some studies which show maybe indians we should have 5 hours exercise More. per week the exercise is not during work it is leisure activity don't say sir i am walking so much i am standing so much no if it is a leisure activity of 5 hours per week that is better than like people say in shop floor i walk around and all i don't consider as an exercise at all you keep that 5 hours in 7 days i think that will be better for cardiovascular rather than diabetes with this note i thank professor navid sattar dr uday patke dr sanjay kalra for an excellent interaction my only simple is we i wish i had another 30 to 40 minutes would have done justice to all the topics over to dr altaf kazi for his comment and final conclusion yeah, thank you very much sir for um, moderating the session i on behalf of equimentis and our division overtis thank all esteemed faculties for participating in the esd connect program I express my individual gratitude to Dr. Prasanna Kumar, Dr. Uday Fatke, Dr. Sanjay Kalra, and Dr. Navi Sattar. My gratitude goes to each and every delegate who has joined this uh, finale of ESD Connect. I'm indeed glad to mention that, sir, we had about uh, 1,100 doctors across the uh, country today in India who have joined this uh, program uh, today at this at this hour. It is 10 p.m. in, in India. Uh, who have joined this program and my sincere thanks to my ceo mr pradeep patni and management team at recommendis and all my colleagues from both sales and marketing who have been uh, you know uh, made this program uh, possible today so thank you once again uh, all doctors and thank you delegates thank you so much once again thank, thank you. you good night thank you so much good night good night good night, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.